Kagari, Swagway, or the Hande New Yaks, only the Aga Niwagum Jod, Mogata Hindi Niwagi Tador, Jerunkawane Chitkilu, Lokchi Ann Arbor, Michigan, Nidiwagani. So um, I said, uh, Lahande is my own item name. That means he goes to the front or he goes ahead. I'm a member of the United Nation, also a member of the Wolf Clan. I said, um, I live uh, in the place of the duck, or on the Oneida Reservation here in Wisconsin, and I grew up in or near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I moved here in 94, 95-ish, so I've been around for a while now. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about myself, just a little bit. Um, I have a associate's degree in natural sciences from Haskell Indian Nation University. I also have a, um, a Bachelor of Arts in American Indian Studies from Haskell. Um, I, I went to school at UWGB for uh, MS in Education um, under the Professional Program of Education. And I spent the better part of five years working on a PhD in Buffalo uh, in Native Studies studying um, everything that has to do with who we are. So I studied the Confederacy, um, the Haudenosaunee people, I studied our people, I studied the, the history and our movement of our people to here. Um, I also studied the ways that some of our people didn't move here. Uh, some of them stayed, a lot of moving around during the wars in that time too, so. Um, lots of different things. And But my specialty was in my PhD, my focus was always on um, cultural identity, so finding out who we are um, as Oneida people or, or Lodi Nashoni people, that's always been my passion, so there's a lot of information out there. Uh, there's th when I started uh, doing this kind of study, it uh, really opened up a lot of different doors for me, and I, I realized the more that I study, the more that I realize I don't know, <laughs> so um, especially with the language. So I'm still working on getting the language down, uh, but I'm doing okay with it. It's frustrating sometimes, but um, my English name is Lou Williams Jr. Uh, Lou Williams Niungyats Otsunige. And today we're going to be talking about Yodasawa um, Nigalano, or the beginning, that kind of story. That's what we, one of the ways that we call our creation story. Uska hadum. Anybody know what that means? Uska? One, right? When you put a hadu on the end, it means kind of first. So the first thing that I'll talk about will be ji gahunya wage, which means in the sky world. And then the second part of my discussion will be degni hadum ji ohunjage. So we'll be talking about, or ji ohunjage, <clears throat> we'll be talking about here on Earth, here on, on Mother Earth. So in the very, very beginning of the stories that I'm familiar with, um, it all goes back to the sky world. And what we usually see or what we usually read or hear about is there's a boy and a girl that's born, um, and there's a, a elder woman and an elder man. And the two, the twins, if you will, because they are twins, a uh, boy and a girl though, uh, they're born from the elder woman. And what they say is that these twins, or this boy and this girl, uh, are born with a gift. They're born special. Um, and what we call that nowadays would be, a, well, what it's, what it's, what it's uh, referred to as is under the husk. And when children are born under the husk, it means that they're born with the, um, with the embryonic sac still intact around them. So the, the water from the female hasn't broke yet, though, so they're still kind of in, in this, uh, under the husk, right? <clears throat> so when this happens, um, we're supposed to take really good care of these gifted individuals, and their parents, their mom, knew that. So their mom decided to split them up and decided to protect them. And what she did, and the uncle did also, is to help them establish 
little rooms on the ends of the longhouse that they were living in so that they were protected from all the people on the inside and also they were protected from people coming and going too. Um, it, it said that they, they, wanted that they wanted to protect these special kids from um, the evil things that were out there. They wanted to keep them away from all those things until they became adults so that they can be pure and have their gifts, uh, I guess, strong uh, once they do become adults and they can help their people. So <clears throat> they're growing up in these two different areas of the longhouse, if you will, uh, uh, small vestibules or something like that, where you walk in and there's another a room, a small room, before you actually get into the big longhouse. And they grew up pretty fast. A lot of these uh, children in the story grew up really fast for some reason. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not sure exactly why that would be, but um, it, it, goes, it goes with the story a lot of times. So these kids grew up pretty fast, and as they were growing up, they were, um, they were talking with their mom and, and their uncle also, and their uncle told them both that um, he's not feeling so well, and that he said that uh, soon he's going to pass away, and that he gave them specific instructions of what he wanted to have done with him when he passed. So when he did pass away, um, he wanted them to carry his body up into a high tree um, outside the longhouse and tie his body up in his coffin up in that tree. And what he told his, he told his niece, now a young woman, that he will one day be able to communicate with her again if they really need him. So once, once, once they find out if they really need to communicate with him, then they can send somebody up there into the tree and actually talk to him. Um, so um, the young woman listens to her, her uncle, and after he's, oh, I forgot a part. Um, so that uncle, before he passes, or is it after he passes? I think it is after he passes. I did get it right, okay. <laughs> so after he passes, he, um, she goes up and she, she's really upset, this, this young woman, the niece, is really upset uh, because of her uncle passing and she's having a lot of problems and she wants to talk to him. And her mom hears that and um, she tells her mom what her uncle told her. So, um, but she said that I can't climb that tree by myself. So her, her brother ends up helping her uh, up the tree and they both go up and talk to their uncle again and their uncle is really happy to see them. Um, it's kind of a strange thing. They open up the coffin and he's, he's waiting there for them like he's been just waiting for them all along. So he, he goes ahead and he, he starts to explain to her uh, what she's going to be responsible for and what her duties will be in this lifetime that she has. And he, he tells her that she's very important um, that she's going to do some really huge things, like some really, um, really big things in the future, and she's going to be responsible for a lot of stuff, so um, he tells her then that she needs to go and um, be part of this feast that this, the caregiver of the tree um, is putting on, is hosting. So, let me backdrop, give you a little bit of background information. This tree is referred to as a celestial tree. It provides light up in the sky world. It also provides all the food that people need in the sky world. So off of it has all the fruits and vegetables you can imagine. Um, and it also provides light. And I, there's a lot of different um, movies and stories and stuff that we see today that has these themes that are really super similar to the celestial tree. I'm sure that you guys have seen it um, at least a few different times, but one that pops to my mind is always uh, an Avatar movie. <laughs> they talk about the tree of life, and it's like there's so many similarities. It's like, oh my God, this is our story. Where did they get it? But, um, yeah, yeah, there was so. It's, uh, it's interesting, and you, you know, often makes you wonder where they get these stories from. Um, but 
in our way, you know, our, our stories aren't, they don't, we don't possess our stories, so we share them. So if somebody else gets something out of our stories that we didn't, and they want to make a new story out of it, in my opinion, it's fine, fine with me. As long as we uh, keep um, our own story, and we know our own story well, that's fine. So, <clears throat> so the celestial tree up there, there's a caregiver, his, his, they call him Hodehe. Um, in a lot of these different stories, they call him Hodehe, or the, guard, the guardian of the standing tree, or the guardian of the celestial tree. And so he's taking care of this tree. He's making sure that nobody breaks the rules in this, this world that they have. So one of the rules is that you can't pick directly from the tree so that all the fruits and vegetables and everything that comes off that tree has to drop to the ground before you can come and harvest it. And then you can take all you want from whatever is on the ground. But you're not to disturb any parts of the tree while it's, while it's growing, while it's producing. <clears throat> That's one of the big rules for the, the tree. So the uncle up in the up on the tree talks to the the, uh, the niece and the nephew. Tells the niece that she has a big duty coming up, and that she's going to have to go see this guy, the guardian of the tree, or Hodehe, and he's having a feast, and they they want their family to come over there to that feast. So. What happens is um, they come back down the tree and they talk to their mom and their mom says that she wants to go over there first. She wants to see what's going on over there first and she wants to know why they need, why they would want her family specifically to be at this feast. And she goes over there so she takes a walk and she walks over to Hodehe and his lodge and his feast that he's got going on and um, he, he, she finally talks to him and uh, asks him why um, he wants her family there and he asks her if she has two children and if one is a female and one is a male and she said yeah and she said those those two people those two children are the reason why I'm having this feast in the first place and she didn't know anything about that so she went back home and <clears throat> she she got them and told them that <clears throat> especially the niece that she the niece is going to have to go over there now, Horehe has some kind of uh, interest in the niece, uh, specifically. So, <clears throat> the next time they go over to the Horehe's feast, uh, it's just the niece that goes over there. And he, they talk, Horehe and her, the niece, <coughs> and he, they, somehow, somehow or another, she, he says that she, is to be his wife and then she says well I'm not sure about that I'm gonna have to ask my mom so she had to go back to her village and ask her mother for permission and if he was the guy that she was to marry or not because um, her mom has these kind of powers too. this kind of uh, she can kind of see the future um, all those people in the sky world I think have this power too from what I hear <coughs> so so, let's see, so, so Hodehe says that we're having a feast here, and, but I want to I send you with gifts back home um, so you can bring your family and, and tell them how happy I am and the opportunity to maybe marry you um, if your mom will, will give permission. And she says, okay, so she brings back a, a bunch of the food from the feast well, she did not a bunch of the food, it was, I think, dry meat. I think it was just dry meat that he sent her with. Back to her village, and um, so she goes back with that. And then her mom tells her that, um, she, yeah, she can, she can marry this guy, and that he's the right one, and that she has a big duty to do in the, in the future. And she's not sure what that is yet. So she ends up going back to the feast. And the feast is kind of winding down, but he has everybody there at the feast. He has all of creation there. He has all of the animals and all of the birds. Um, he's got the, the west wind is there. Um, the, what they call the, the fire dragon or the comet is there. Um, there's a lot of different... Um, all the beings in the sky world, they come to this, this, uh, this feast. And 
in the beginning, it seemed like it was a, a dream guessing feast or dream guessing ceremony. So this Hodahe is, is kind of throwing this feast and he, he's wanting people to guess his dream and to see what he, to, to see if they can guess what he's been dreaming about. And let's see, I can't remember who ends up guessing the correct one, but one guesses that it's about tobacco and he says no. And another one guesses about um, if it's about uh, corn and he says no. And then another one guesses if it's about um, the tree itself, the celestial tree that he's the guardian of. And he said, yeah, that's, that's part of it. So after that, then they kind of celebrate and somebody's got, um, somebody guessed the right um, dream that he had and guessed the dream right. So that part of the story is, is kind of concluding then. And he decides that he's going to have to have a, um, some kind of feast for his wedding to celebrate his marriage to this woman. Now, I, in all the different creation stories that I've read and I've heard, I haven't heard of a specific ceremony happening for them to be married at. Um, but in the stories, they always talk about the wedding cake. Um, the traditional wedding cake that we have in the longhouse is made out of our white corn and strawberries. And you usually don't see that kind of traditional cake only at weddings. And in the story, it's, um, it's a huckleberry, huckleberry uh, cornbread cake. It sounds really good to me, too. I haven't had it, so... Um, but the wedding cake is really good, so I imagine the suckleberry stuff is even probably even better. <clears throat> so um, they're making those kinds of things. They're producing these foods for this specific ceremony for the wedding, but um, they never talk about if you know the, the actual ceremony happened or not. But after that, they're married, so they're, they're done. <laughs> so this is the down in on Earth. The only thing we have on Earth right now is the water fowls and the water beans. Um, so this is a picture um, representing that. So, ji ohunjage, that's what it looks like on the earth. And they talk about the sky world. So down here is the earth and the water and all the water fowl and uh, there's geese here. And I'm sure there's fish down here somewhere too. And then up here above all the clouds, this is the sky world up here. And they say that it looks the same as our world um, up there, but there's like, there's no like unhappiness, there's no like sickness and everything is like really, really good. Um, and of course the celestial tree that provides light there. And that's the only place you go to get your food, so it's gotta be pretty easy, right? <laughs> Everybody probably just hangs around by the tree. That's what I imagine. So there's the tree that they're talking about. And of course, a lot of people refer to it as a white pine. Uh, white pines are really uh, important in our culture. Uh, the, great, um, the great tree of peace that was planted for the great law is a white pine. Uh, white pine is used by women as medicine also. So they're now a couple. And Hodahe and and gonna be sky woman <laughs> um, or mature blossoms. I still haven't found an Oneida word for that yet. I, I know it's somewhere. I just haven't found it. I was asking all kinds of people today. But anyway, so the mature blossoms they sleep what they call um, with their soles of their feet together. So after they get married, they're together, and they, feed, they sleep with the soles of their feet together. And it said that when they wake up, they wake up and face each other, and they're, they're, they're intermingling their breaths. And from what, how a lot of the stories go, that breaths, the breaths that they intermingle ends up making her pregnant. So she becomes pregnant. And as she's be beginning to get larger and larger, 
Um, she tells him that she wants him to go dig up the roots from this celestial tree so that she can have some tea because she's not feeling good. And as he's like kind of and I'm reluctant about it. He's like, I don't know if I should do that because, you know, of the rules and I'm the, the, the caregiver of the tree and I'm enforcing these rules, but I'm going to be breaking them now. And as he's walking over there, he's like, I don't know if I can do this or not. And he's, then he gets down on the ground and he starts digging and he figures out that he can't do it because of the rules that he knows. He felt, he felt way too bad about doing that to that tree because he, he thinks to himself that he's, he's putting in danger all the people in the sky world. If he damages that tree and it never comes back to life, then what's going to happen to all those people up there? The sky people. He stops and he goes back and tells her that he can't do it. And she kind of gets upset and, and says, well, if, if you can't do it, then I'm just going to go do it myself then. And she starts digging up these roots and she ends up uprooting this entire tree. In the, the myth of the earth grasper here, in this book, um, the Hewitt version, um, the, uh, they say that they're both sitting there dangling their feet down this chasm, this big hole. And they're both looking down in it and they see everything down below. They see the water and some of the uh, waterfowl and the birds and stuff flying around down there. And they get really curious. And one of them says that, one, one version says that she gets too curious and leans forward too much and falls on her own. And this version in this book says that, uh, I forgot the exact wording, but it says that um, your fate is to be down there and then he just pushes her. So there's a lot of different versions, and I'm not sure, that, you know, if there's not a right or wrong way to tell it, I guess. Um, but she in, eventually ends up falling through this hole that the, the celestial tree had been uprooted. Some of these versions, they, they talk about the they talk about the dream that Hodahe had, and that dream talks about the celestial tree and how it's to be uprooted. And then the, the guys that Hodahe hangs out with, he tells them that this is, has to be done because this is my dream, and they go dig up the tree. So there's a lot of different um, there's some differences here and there. And one of the stories, they, they say that as she's falling, she, she's grasping at all the roots and the different things that are in the uh, soil. And one of the versions says that she picks up the roots for the strawberry and picks up the roots for the tobacco plant. And she, she picks up um, roots and plants from the red willow. And that's what she has as she's falling down to earth. That's what she's carrying. So she's falling. <coughs> falling down and it's all dark down there. Um, she can't really see much. And I believe it's, let's see, there's, sometimes it's geese and sometimes it's the moons. And as she's coming down through the sky, the loons are carrying her. All the things down in the water are wondering where she's going to land. And they don't know where she's going to land. They're, they're worried for her. So... They all say that if we dive down far enough underneath this water, there's dirt and there's mud down here. And I think that if we can find somebody that can be strong enough to let her rest on, then I think that she'll be able to survive. So I think it was a beaver first that volunteered to carry her or to have her on his back. And she, the loons came down and placed her on the beaver's back. And after a little while, the beaver said, "I'm not gonna, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not gonna be able to do this." So, they asked the uh, the big sea turtle if he would do it. So he says, "Yeah, I think that I could. I would be able to do that." 
so he waits for her, and she the loons come down, and um, they place her on the turtle's back. And as this is all happening, they're still trying to dive down and get that dirt so that she can have something to live on, some kind of land to live on. But one by one, these these water beings are diving down into the water. And a lot of them can't get down far enough, so they come up empty-handed. Well, the nogi, or the muskrat, he says, I can dive really far down. And I can hold my breath for a long time. So he says he's going to do his best. So he dives way down there. And she's resting on the back of that turtle, still waiting. And when he comes back up, he wasn't able to hold his breath the whole time. He came up and he was already dead. But uh, the other being, seeing that he had dirt in his mouth and in his, in his paws that he had brought up with him from the bottom. So they took that dirt from his mouth and his paws and they, they put it on the turtle's back and she rubbed it around a little bit and then it just started growing for her. And it got so big that she was able to sit on it and stand on it. And the turtle said, "Yeah, I can, I can do this because as the he says, as the as the land or the dirt grows on my back, so will I. So as the as the dirt gets bigger, the land gets bigger, so will he." So a lot of the stories will tell you at this point that the sky woman um, stands up and begins dancing, and she dances. Um, as she's dancing, our women, what we call it. We call it, they, they massage, they massage the ground, or they massage the earth with their feet. Um, if you ever see a, a, at the longhouse or a ceremony or a, um, a social, sometimes you see women dancing and their, their feet never leave the ground, or their feet kind of massage the ground as they're dancing. And that goes all the way back to this creation story, all the way back to Sky Woman dancing Turtle Island into existence. So Sky Woman dances around on the dirt of this turtle's back and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and soon there's all kinds of like grasses and stuff growing on it. And <clears throat> so they're all happy now that she's got a place to survive and stay and be, be healthy and happy. And she's pregnant, so um, <coughs> she's pregnant and she's <coughs> about to have a baby and she's now got this land that she can survive upon and the birds and all everything are helping her. And she has this baby, and she has a little girl. And once again, the baby grows really, really fast. So her daughter grows up super fast, and all of a sudden she's a young woman. And, and while she's growing up, she's always curious, and she's always like walking around and checking things out on Turtle Island. And she wants to see how you know, everything works, and. She wants to see the, the end of the Turtle Island. She wants to see the ocean and the water and those kinds of things. So she's walking around and experiencing all these things. She meets a, a man. So he's, he looks like a good looking man. And um, I'm not sure if she gets her mom's permission at this point or not. I think she does. She goes back and she she tells her mom about this man that she met. And she tells him who he is. And she gives her permission to uh, get, you know, to get, to hook up with him and get, get married or whatever. So, so they end up together. And from this part of the story, I remember he brings arrows to her and her grandmother's lodge when they first meet. And he has one that has a point, uh, a good point on it, and it's straight. And he has one that's kind of jagged and has a, like a crooked point on it. And he lays those on her stomach and he tells her not to touch them until the next day when he comes back. He'll take them off her belly for her. So once again, this is how she got pregnant. 
um, there's different things in the creation story how these how these women get pregnant, and it's kind of interesting. I, I think they're really interesting both ways. It's, it's almost like, it's almost magical, right? So this guy's got special powers. And he gets her pregnant, and she's pregnant with these two twins. And one of the twins is represented by that straight arrow. Or they call him, um, they refer to him as the right-handed twin. Uh, and the other twin um, is signified by that crooked, the crooked arrow and the not so sharp little point arrow. And they call him uh, Flint. Um, they call the right-handed twin um, the holder of the heavens or the holder of the sky. And his name is Dehahun Kiawagu. And then the, uh, let's see, the other, the other twin, they call him they call him Flint, or actually his name is Flinty, they call him. But um, we refer to him as Sawiskla. 